All right, guys, so check it out. Just as I was filming uh, this video for the War of Art, this book review, the War of Art's all about resistance, all about overcoming inner battles, inner struggles. I set my computer on this knick-knack Christmas table at my mother's house, right there. And this guy, this devilish snowman of a mug, right there, look at that evil bastard. Knocks over and spills all over the floor, all over my computer, almost fries the hard drive. I almost quit, I almost didn't do the book review and my computer's still dripping water, so I don't even know why I'm filming this. Should be putting in a bag of rice. But I just wanted to show you that when shit hits the fan, you just gotta push through. And I'm gonna push through and do this book review that I haven't filmed yet, even though the water almost ruined this whole day. I almost killed like $2,000 worth of equipment. Um, you gotta push through and you gotta do it anyway. You can't let stuff stop you. You can't even let water on your computer stop you from doing a video. Okay, so let's do this thing. And we are recording. What's up guys? Clark back again from ClarkDanger.com. This is the channel where we focus on ideas that make us stop settling and start living. Today's book, enough rambling, let's get to it. Boom, The War of Art. It means a lot to me. I've been having some really big changes in life, deciding to do this full time, go for it. And I faced a ton of resistance. Limiting beliefs, fear, doubts, insecurities, everything just coming up. And what Stephen Pressfield's book is on and what we're going to talk about today is the inner battle that we all face. Um, and that is getting over the resistance, the fear, the limiting beliefs, and everything that stops you from what you want to do. Okay, so I got five points today. I'll keep this really short. And we'll dive right into it. Stephen Pressfield, he's big on war. I mean, his book's called The War of Art. He was a fiction writer, I believe. Um, wrote Gates of Fire, Tides of War. He's an honorary citizen of Sparta. You know, 300 movies. And his take on the whole resistance, fear, limiting beliefs is that we're too easy on ourselves with it. You know, in the self-help community, it's like, oh, check your, check your limiting beliefs or uh, think positively. And he says, no, you have to treat it as if you're fighting a war against yourself from the lower level to the higher level. And the enemy you're facing is not some external guy chugging through foxholes on the battlefield. It's an internal force he calls resistance. So let's define it. All of us have two lives. We have the life that we're living and we have the unlived life within us. And between the two stands, you guessed it, resistance. So we can use the five things we're going to talk about right here to overcome resistance and to take action and do what we want to do, go to where we want to go, and stop settling, start living. Boom, catchphrase. Let me talk about a few areas uh, Stephen goes into to saying, you know, these are the most common areas we face resistance in. Okay, so let's read that. Uh, the list, in no particular order, of those activities that most commonly elicit resistance. One, the pursuit of any calling in writing, painting, music, film, dance, or any creative art, however marginal or unconventional. Two, the launching of any entrepreneurial venture or enterprise. Three, any diet or health regimen. Four, any program of spiritual advancement. Five, any activity whose those are... Uh, whose aim is to get tighter abs. Okay, a little comedy there. Uh, six, any course or program designed to overcome a, you know, unwholesome habit or addiction, education, yada, yada, yada. So what do those, all those things have in common? They have, you're moving from a lower plane to a higher plane. You're advancing yourself. Um, fancy way of saying they all have change in common. And anytime we have change in our life, this is a fact, we face resistance. Now, it's common to feel fear when you want to change. And uh, that's the first point in this book that I want to hit on. That fear should not be avoided. In fact, it should be embraced. Let's dive into that. So this quote's about fear. 
like a magnetized needle floating in the surface of oil, resistance will unfailingly point true north, meaning that our calling or action is what it most wants us to stop from stop us from doing. We can use this. We can use it as a compass. We can navigate by resistance, letting it guide us to our calling or action that we must follow before all others. So rule of thumb, the more important a call or action is to our soul's evolution, the more resistance we will feel towards pursuing it. So reframe fear. If what you were doing, if you weren't afraid, well, that means it doesn't matter to you. And the times in your life you've been most afraid have meant something to you. You know, there's that cliche floating around with the bride or the groom who gets cold feet at their wedding. It's not because they didn't, it didn't mean anything. It's because it, it, it almost meant so much. I'm assuming here. I've never had cold feet. I don't know if you have. Um, if it didn't mean anything, they probably wouldn't have even committed to that in the first place. So we can reframe it now. And almost be thankful, I know it sounds a little cliche, almost be thankful that we have fear because it shows us like the magnetized needle which way to head towards, okay? And that's where courage comes in and all these other tactics, but really reframing it that you go after fear. The second one, burnout's procrastination. The basic trend of a project goes like this. You start the project, the new diet, health regimen, the tighter abdominals, right? And you are so motivated. Things, uh, your motivation level is a 10, sometimes 11 out of 10. Uh, You order the deluxe overnight shipping on P90X because you saw the infomercial. You saw yourself three months later and boom, you have it. Okay, so you start off really, really strong. When you get into business, you know, you research the hell out of it. It's all you want to do. Or when you get in a new relationship, it's all you think about, you're obsessed. So that's the peak. And then over time, you realize, oh, this is more work than I thought. Um, this could be two weeks into P90X, and you're like, you know, I'm not really getting the results I thought I'd be getting. Or it starts to become almost a chore, and uh, the initial excitement is now dwindling. And then eventually, you get to the bottom. And that's the danger point. That's where resistance really kicks in and tries to get you to quit. Um, That's the low point. This is probably a month in. It's also known as like the plateau when you stop getting the gains and you you, you get diminishing returns. Um, You're at the low point there and it's, it's it's easy to quit here. It's not as fun. It's not as exciting. And um, if we allow ourselves to quit at that bottom point all the time, well, then we're just bouncing on from project to project to project to project to project. Okay, and that's why burnouts can be detrimental is because not only do you not continue on that project because you went too, uh, too intensely in the beginning, but you do that for everything. You know, there's a saying on HGTV, I think, you know, the home garden television show where they're building all these construction projects. And uh, it's like a realtor term that projects take twice as long and cost twice as much to complete than you think they will. So know that when you're, you're doing anything, either it's diet, exercise, uh, starting a business, or getting somewhere where you want to be in a relationship, it's going to take twice as long and cost twice as much as you think to complete. Hopefully not the relationship part, right? Um, have realistic expectations is an easy way to sum that up. Okay, don't be overambitious at the start. It's good to use your excitement but be realistic at the same time. And then procrastination comes in. Sometimes we don't even burn out because we never even start, um, or we say we're going to start it tomorrow. So let me read you a quote here from The War of Art on procrastination. He says, Procrastination is the most common manifestation of resistance because it's the easiest to rationalize. We don't tell ourselves, I'm never going to write my symphony. Instead, we say, I'm going to write my symphony I'm just going to start tomorrow. Man, that's a good quote. Never gets easier. Whatever you want to do, diet, business, relationship, success, any habit change, start it today, okay? Don't procrastinate. The third thing, let's talk about criticism and jealousy. We've all had bursts of feeling critical, either of others or yourself, overly self-critical. Beat yourself up time and time again. Or you've either been jealous, seen other people's success, and wondered why that hasn't been you. So how do we get past being critical and jealous? Well, in the book, 
Pressfield argues that um, those are resistance is tools on us, that it gets us to see others and write them off as lucky or it, it got all handed to them and they didn't have to put in the work. So we can rationalize internally and we don't have to take action on it. Here's a rule of thumb with criticism. The more critical you are of other people, the less you are doing what you need to do in your life. So next time you're critical, check if it's because you're not showing up and doing what you need to do and that it can actually be resistance. Jealousy is another one too because that's different than criticism. Criticism's like wanting to give people advice and, and talking to them and telling them what they need to do. Jealousy is almost this internal uh, spite towards that person because you see, you see what they're doing and it makes you double take on yourself and see if you're doing it. So being jealous can be a form of resistance. Fourth point, the amateur versus the professional. So in the book, he distinguishes between the amateur and the pro. And that amateur comes from the Latin word, I believe, which means to love. And that he says the common, the common theory floating around in society is that if you're an amateur at something, you love it. It's your hobby. It's your passion. But you're not doing it professionally um, because you don't need money for it. You, you love it so much that you'll do it for free on your, on your own time. He says that that's not true, and he disagrees. That the amateur doesn't actually love the work enough. If they did, they'd pursue it full-time. They would turn pro. So what does it mean to turn pro? Let me dive into the book and, and share that with you. These are traits of the pro according to Pressfield. One, we show up every day. Two, we show up no matter what. Three, stay on the job all day. Four, are committed over the long haul. Five, the stakes are high and real. Six, we accept payment for our labor. They're not in it for fun, they work for money. Uh, seven, we do not over-identify with our jobs. Eight, we master the technique. Nine, we have a sense of humor about our jobs. And ten, we receive praise and blame in the real world. So a question on that then is, what are you doing in your life now that you absolutely love and how can you turn pro and do that? It's one of the 11 questions to change your life in, in the book. We, I ask, if you had all the time, all the money in the world, what would you do? There's also a question in there, how do you get paid to do what you love? Those two questions are really powerful because you're able to reframe what you're doing and say, I love this, can I make money off of it? And how do I do that? How do I turn pro? The thing I want to leave you with is the last point, and that is give your gifts. You know, there seems to be a, a thought you can slip into that when you're doing your creative work, your hobby, or your, what you're an amateur at before you turn pro, that it's a waste of time or it's, it's only for you and that it doesn't matter to anyone else. That it's almost selfish to retreat inward and make music or paint or write and that it really doesn't matter to other people. Um, let me share, let me read you this. It may help to think of it this way. If you were meant to cure cancer or write a symphony or crack cold fusion and you don't do it, you not only hurt yourself, even destroy yourself, you hurt your children, you hurt me, you hurt the planet. Creative work is not, is not a selfish act or a bid for attention on the part of the actor. It is a gift to the world and every being in it. Don't cheat us of your contribution. Give us what you got. It's powerful stuff. He's saying that if we have a gift, we need to share it. And if we don't share it, that that is more selfish. That's the last point I want to leave you with is give your gifts. It's not a selfish thing to do. In fact, it's selfless. And um, War of Art. That's it, guys. That's, that's this month's book. Really cool stuff in here. Uh, talked about fear as your true north. Burnouts, procrastination. Criticism and jealousy the amateur versus the professional, and giving your gifts. Okay, so cool book. Pick it up. There's a link down below. And if you want the one-page summary I threw together, uh, just with these ideas more in-depth a little bit, still really short, you can download it at the link below. Okay, that's it from me to you. Stop settling, start living. I'll see you next time.